afternoon or good morning, um, depending on, on where you're located here. Um, we're pleased to be continuing our Eden Professional Development Webinar Series here in 2018. So Happy New Year to everyone. In this third webinar, we are going to be talking about commu communicating about risk. And I kind of put the tagline, it's more than just information after looking at Sarah's, Sarah's information for us. Let me move forward here. So we are pleased to have Sarah Watson as our presenter today. She is a Coastal Climate and Resilience Specialist at the South Southern Carolina, South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium and Carolina's Integrated Sciences and Assessment. She has consulted with NOAA Office on Coastal Management on a number of different topics related to coastal climate resiliency. And she also um, was one of the lead developers in the Risk Communications Basics, which is a guidebook that I'm sure she'll talk a little bit more about. I'm not going to, to go further with introducing Sarah because she's going to add a little bit in. I would just um, also like to say I'll be coming back at the end. We do have an evaluation that we would like you to complete. So be looking for a link to a Qualtrics series that I will be putting up in the chat box and help us evaluate this program. So we're pleased that so many of you were able to, to sign in today. And with that, I will stop sharing and let turn it over to Sarah for a great presentation. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, I'm always really excited to talk about risk communication because it's so important um, and such an important topic that I know that all of us um, really want to get better at because we know that it's really important to making sure that we get our messages across. And as Cheryl talked about um, initially, just the, it is more than just giving more information. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the social science lessons behind why we perceive risks the way that we do, and then how we can incorporate those lessons into improving our communication and outreach so that we make our messages and our just overall communication more effective. Um, so a little bit more about me. Um, I, uh, I'm brand new for Sea Grant. I, I just started in October and I'm extremely excited to be working for South Carolina Sea Grant. Um, prior to all of my work in resilience, I was a environmental reporter for the Press of Atlantic City and a few other newspapers. And my last really big assignment as a reporter was covering Hurricane Sandy recovery in New Jersey. And my experience on the ground watching how practitioners communicated with um, residents about risks and about things that uh, they needed to be able to do, and then also communicating with the residents who were then perceiving that information really inspired me to go back to graduate school um, at Rutgers University to study public policy and urban planning with a focus on stakeholder engagement and risk communication so that perhaps I could help improve that communication. Um, so first, I just want to briefly talk about what risk communication is, and I think we all have our own idea of what that means, um, but I'm, I'm not necessarily going to give a uh, definition, but I am going to talk about the two key types of risk communication. And that first one is the short term or the crisis, and that's where the emergency is about to hit us, and that we're, we're trying to get people to make immediate actions or take immediate actions right now. And that's not the risk communication that I'm going to talk about, even though a lot of the social science uh, lessons that we do, uh, that I will be discussing, do affect how we perceive that, that communication. I'm really focusing on the long-term risk or the future um, risk where the emergency is not there. The, the risk does not necessarily feel immediate. It does not feel necessarily personal. Um, the challenge with this is that because it's not immediate right now, it's not something that we necessarily prioritize in, in our minds as we're hearing that information. And so the challenge is to work within that and start moving that forward. And I will give some tips in a little bit about how to do that. So I first wanna talk a little bit about why people just do things the way that they do. And everything that I'm going to describe, you may see some of yourself in this. I know everything that I talk about, I do. Um, so we all do this and it's just how we do that affects how we perceive each individual risk. So. The first thing I'm going to just talk about very basic is just how we process thoughts and, and information coming in. And the first way that we th process thoughts is emotionally. 
um, or through um, our experience. And that's a really fast way that our mind works. It does not take much time or energy. Um, it, it's actually pretty immediate. And, you know, for an example, if you saw this dog uh, walking down the street and you, were, you saw this dog, you have a very intense reaction and you're not going to sit there and try to figure out whether the dog is coming after you or barking after you, you're going to leave. You're going to get out of there. Um, and that can also be thought, referred to as thinking fast. And that's very fast, does not take much energy or emotion, a thought. It just happens. So that's about the vast majority of our thoughts, believe it or not. So the second kind of way that we think, um, the second predominant way that we process information is also referred to as thinking slow. And that's more analytical. Um, and that's where you're, you know, perhaps you're looking at a math problem or something that you're calculating, and it takes you a few seconds to think about it. Um, it doesn't necessarily uh, come quickly, but it also takes a little bit more energy. And as a result, that's, you know, sometimes that's why we're so tired after a really long day of work where we didn't really do much that we thought of, but we really did a lot of thinking. Um, so now that we have those, I want to go back to that emotion because the emotion is such a really key part of how we uh, perceive risks. Because how we feel about a risk ultimately influences whether or not we perceive it as something that's going to affect us. And I always like to use a, a fun little um, uh, example that I think a lot of us have very strong feelings toward, and that's clowns. Um, and I think some of you are growing up. If this was all you ever knew about a clown, how would you feel about clowns? You're probably like, yeah, that's pretty cute. I'm not worried about that. That's, that's adorable. Um, and unfortunately, you all know what's coming next. So now how do you feel about clowns? Um, yeah, you're probably like, ah, terrifying. Um, the thing is that when we talk about things in terms of uh, invoking fear or dread, um, or those very negative emotions, that can actually be really challenging when we're communicating about that, because we don't really have, uh, each individual doesn't necessarily have that much space to handle all of those negative emotions. And, and that's because we all have something called the finite pool of worry. Um, and I, I like to use this picture of this very crowded swimming pool in, in Japan, and, and use this as, you know, imagine that this pool is your brain. And imagine that all of your worries are those people and those floaties. And that's all of your worries and your thoughts and your concerns. And you can see that there's really not very much uh, water that's open left. There's really just not that much space for you to worry about something else. And so when you look at it in terms of perceiving risks, if you're really worried about uh, trying to get your kids to school or put dinner on the table or make sure your rent is paid, you're not necessarily going to have the, the, the mental space or energy to think about planning for something that's long term in the future, um, such as preparing for climate change or fire season or hurricane season. Um, the next shortcut that I want to talk about is anchoring, and that's where we tend to focus or, or set our, our, our benchmark, if you will, on what has happened in the past. And unfortunately, that can lead us to under-perceiving a, a risk or a threat, or even over-perceiving a risk or a threat. And unfortunately, uh, I've seen a lot of this actually happen. You know, for example, I, I'm from New Jersey. I'm now in South Carolina. Um, but, you know, for example, in South Carolina, people who have been here in Charleston for a very long time tend to connect um, anything that's happening in the future with Hurricane Hugo. Whereas, um, and so if, if, if it wasn't as bad as Hugo, therefore it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but they don't necessarily realize that if Hugo had hit 20 miles to the south, they in the city of Charleston would be in, in a much more severe situation. And so that's the event that they, they anchor on, but they sometimes will misperceive the actual risk. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is confirmation bias. And, and that one I think is something that the more that we hear or the more information that we're given, uh, and the more information that's available to us, it's just kind of that 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 mental shortcut that we tend to fall on the easiest because it's just really easy to do. Um, and that's where you cherry pick information to confirm what you already believe. And unfortunately, um, that can lead you to you know dismissing a threat that's that's perhaps a real threat to you, um, or it may actually lead you to over perceiving a threat um, or a risk. Um, the next one uh, is single action bias. And I use the, uh, the image of the light bulbs as an example of that. And that, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, we were kind of all under that, given that message that if we just changed our light bulbs, uh, we would be able to, you know, prevent climate change. And that it just isn't one thing that would be all you had to do. And unfortunately, as, as I think we all know, that's not necessarily the case. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of us will, will still, you know, 
change the light bulbs or maybe we'll recycle, but we don't necessarily uh, reduce other, uh, change other behaviors that um, lead, to, lead to a better, um, you know, climate. So uh, the next one we talk about is the status quo and that we are hardwired to avoid change. We don't necessarily like to change and that change is really hard and because it forces us to have to spend energy um, and mental energy in, in rewriting those wires, if you will, in your head. Um, and so that's why it's really hard to get people to change their behavior because they just don't want to, or it's just difficult. Um, and I'm sure that you can all imagine what that's like. It's, it's January and everybody's trying to rewrite that, you know, go through that New Year's resolution of maybe they want to exercise more or change their diet. And it's really hard to do because you, you are, you're already in that pattern. You already have those behaviors in your mind. And so it's really hard to change. Um, the next one I want to talk about is unrealistic optimism, and that's quite simply, we don't think bad things are going to happen to us. And, you know, I heard this a lot after Sandy, and that when I interviewed folks about why they didn't evacuate, um, the universal response was, I didn't think it would be that bad. Or, we don't get hurricane storm surges here in New Jersey. They get them in Alabama or in Florida. They don't get them here. Um, and so, they, they, even though they had been warned and given all that information, they just didn't take the appropriate action because they just quite simply didn't think it would happen to them. Um, and now I want to talk about social amplification, and, and that's where um, the more that you hear about a risk, it, the more you perceive it as real, and that's just a very simple way of putting it. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, that often will, you know, the more we hear our friends and family talking about something, or the more we hear it on TV, or the more we hear it on social media or see it on social media and maybe all combined, that leads us to perhaps over perceive something about the risk and sometimes under perceiving it as a risk. And, you know, for example, how many of you were worried about catching Ebola um, or had even heard about Ebola before uh, the outbreak a few years ago? And then how many of you, after hearing about it on the news over and over and over again, were suddenly afraid that you might get Ebola? Um, that's one of those things where the more that we hear about it, the more that we perceive it as something that's going to affect us personally. Um, the next one I want to talk about is uh, something that I, I refer to as worldview, and, I, and a lot of researchers refer to this as worldview. And this is really um, a very simple way of trying to look at how each individual perceives the world, and that we all see the world slightly differently, and we all, and that affects how we make decisions, and also just how we perceive whether something is a risk or whether something is um, something that we need to be concerned about. And what worldview does is it measures uh, two lines of how we see the world, and and then it creates those four categories that kind of have people in each category have a, a more cohesive way of seeing, um, you know, they're, 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 they kind of more agree with each other. And so the first line is, is looking at how we um, think our ideal society should function. And that's, you know, whether you're more individualistic and in that you think that society functions best with minimal involvement from, you know, government or regulations. And then you have that communitarian mindset where you think that um, society functions best when you have more um, interaction from a larger entity uh, kind of keeping things uh, together. Um, and then the next one uh, that we look at is, um, from hierarchy to egalitarian, and that's looking at uh, how we think people should interact with each other. Um, and for example, egalitarian folks tend to think that we function best with when everybody is equal and that um, we have no, no barriers, um, whereas hierarchy tends to do kind of the opposite. And as a result, you end up with these four categories that um, they're not necessarily the, you know, most people are not necessarily on the edges, they're more toward the middle. Um, and that influences how you perceive and see a problem and see a challenge. Um, somebody who's um, more egalitarian and communitarian tends to view that, you know, we're all in this together and that we all need to work together as a community or as a, a region to do things um, together for the, for the benefit of the common good. Whereas somebody who is the opposite, you know, the hierarchy individualism tends to think, well, you know, I need to, be ta I need to take care of myself. I need to be more personally responsible for my own actions. And so ultimately, that is one of those ways of how um, it affects whether or not we view a risk and, and how that risk might affect us. Um, and on, so, you know, overall, what, what shapes risk perception? Um, your worldview and your value, um, your emotions, how you feel about a risk, um, whether or not you've experienced something, and also how you felt during that experience. If you had very negative emotions that might in that experience that might cause you to over perceive the risk in the future. Um, and if you, you know, had 
not so negative emotions, maybe it would be something that you're not as concerned about. Um, what your friends and your family think. Uh, we, we all are very social creatures and we care about what our, you know, our social network thinks. And we tend to moderate our views to match our social network. And so if your friends and your family aren't necessarily concerned about something, you're more likely to not be as concerned as well. Um, and if you end up changing your social network and your social new, no, your new group of folks is more concerned about something, your views are going to start moderating to start matching those a little bit. Um, and then the next one is do you trust the messenger? Trust is an essential part of that message and whether or not you're going to perceive something or, or recognize something as real or a risk. And if it comes from, uh, the, if the messenger is not somebody you trust, you're going to automatically kind of filter that out of saying, yeah, that's something I need to worry about. Whereas if it's somebody that you do trust, um, that's going to be a cue for you to automatically think, you know what, maybe that's something I need to pay attention to. Um, we also connect risks with our solutions and whether or not we, we do that unconsciously and, and whether or not that solution that is, is, is the response to the risk, whether that's realistic and also whether you agree with it. And, and ultimately, you may not realize you're doing that, but if you disagree with the solution, you know, maybe it's a larger thing that requires much more regulatory involvement. Um, and you're somebody whose uh, worldview is more, um, you know, less of a fan of more regulatory involvement. You're kind of going to subconsciously uh, move away toward thinking that that's a risk or something that's going to affect you. Um, so now that we talked a little bit about why we kind of do things the way that we do, I want to go into some of those tips about communicating about risk. And I'm going to talk first a little bit about some basic communications 101, and that these two things are really essential to just simply planning anything out and figuring out what you're going to say. And that's quite simply, who are you going to talk to? Um, what, who's your audience? And that can be anything from one person to a whole lot of people. Um, but really understand who your audience is and who are you, you know, who are you communicating with? And notice what they say with, I'm not saying to, because communication is really a two-way street. It's a conversation. It's not, uh, it's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. Um, and then what do you want people to do with that information? Um, it's not necessarily what you want them to learn, that that's sometimes a really important goal. It's what do you want them to do? What's that action you want them to take? That's ultimately what kind of leads toward changing behavior. Um, and so figuring out who you're talking to and who do you want to, um, or who you're, who you're communicating with and what you want them to do with that information is really essential to the next step. And that's quite simply plan for things, prepare for things, test whatever you're saying with people uh, who are not your colleagues and practice. If you're going to have a conversation with somebody who you know is diametrically opposed to something that you're working with, it's helpful to practice that conversation ahead of time so that you're not caught off guard when you're doing it in the middle of it. And also, it, testing that message helps make sure that that's effective for the, the, your audience. Maybe you, you know somebody that is in the group of folks that you're trying to work with, and maybe you can have them pull them aside and say, hey, can you look at this? Is this, is this something that is going to work? Or, or can, you, you know, can you listen to me talk for a minute and then give me your thoughts? Um, and then just you know, underscoring the importance of this ladder, rinse, repeat, keep doing this over and over and over again. And the only way to really get good at communicating about risk is to keep practicing um, and to keep planning, preparing, testing, and practicing. Um, you know, I go back to that audience and that it's essential to get to know who you're talking with and finding out who they are and what matters to them. That's one of those key things that I think sometimes we're not necessarily really great at doing because we just, we get into our, you know, we, we, know, what we, want to, we know what we want to communicate, but we don't necessarily know who we're communicating with. So getting to know who our audience is, really getting to know who our audience is, and, and finding out what they care about, connecting to what they care about in terms of, you know, finding out what's important to them, and then connecting our message to what they care about, and making that message about the risk and, and about the solution, connecting to that, that, that what, what, what's important to folks. Because if they don't think it's relevant to them, or they don't think that it's something that they're going to care about, or maybe it's affecting something that, that's not something that, that, that's their priority, that's going to kind of say, okay, that's really great information, but I don't really know what to do with it, and they're going to move on. Um, the next thing is that what is really essential is connecting the risk with the solution. And, and that's because it's really good, it's really important to connect that action. And people necessar don't necessarily know what to do. You say, okay, we have this thing in the future. 
Um, and a lot of times we're like, yeah, okay, that's great. That's nice to know. I don't know what to do about it. I can't do anything. But that there are things that they can do. And connecting that solution with the risk helps make that risk communication more effective. Um, the next thing I just want to note is that solutions are not one size fits all. And, and that's a lot of times, you know, when in flood preparedness, we focus on the homeowner. Um, but maybe the homeowner can't afford to do the mitigation action, or maybe somebody is living in a structure that they don't own, or maybe they don't have the ability to, to buy a preparedness kit or, or buy the materials for a disaster preparedness kit because they don't have that money, or maybe they're going to tap into that kit at the end of the month when they're waiting for their next paycheck. So sometimes, you know, they can't necessarily spend money for an action, and so maybe that's an opportunity to say, you know, let's talk about what you would do if you had to evacuate. Where would you go? Who, what would you take with you? And help, you know, make those baby steps first. Um, but not necessarily saying you need to do this or you need to do that. That's going to cause people to just turn away from the conversation because it's just overwhelming or it's not relevant to them. Um, next one that um, is really important and it takes a lot of practice and skill. And, and this was actually in the risk communication guidebook, uh, risk communication basics. And that's called framing the conversation. And quite simply, that is casting the conversation in a way that affirms somebody's what they care about or what their personal values are. You know, maybe you're connecting, um, it's important to be prepared or it's important to work together and that that works with, with somebody's worldview in certain ways. Um, but sometimes maybe it's quite simply just framing the conversation around um, an action that they can do right now and that, you know, so that they don't necessarily feel like uh, the converse, you know, what we're talking about is just not for them. So there's a lot more about that in the risk communication guidebook. I don't really have the time to go into it right now. Um, but that's generally what one of those really important tips is to look up framing. Um, finding those trusted messengers. Uh, I have a picture of firefighters up here because believe it or not, firefighters are, the, are one of the most trusted people in your community. Um, because they're the heroes, they're saving lives, and they're going out there to to do their job, and and you know they're very visible. And and there was a really great story that I heard at a national adaptation forum about a, a, a situation in in I believe it was Flagstaff, Arizona, where the city was trying to get uh, an ordinance passed, or or I think it was actually a referendum passed to help pay for some fire um, suppression, fire uh, mitigation activities that was going to cost uh, the community uh, some money. And so rather than in enacting or, or enlisting the, the local elected officials to, to talk to the residents, they enlisted the fire department and they ended up passing the, the referendum. Um, so that's one of those examples where you find that trusted messenger um, and that can really help your efforts be much more effective. But at the same time, creating those partnerships um, is essential. And, and also the partnerships with those trusted messengers is essential because it's also really important to get people on the same page and making sure that that message among all those trusted partners is consistent and making sure that everybody's saying the same thing. Maybe they're saying it slightly differently, but they're all really saying the same thing. And that's because the more that people hear messages from people that they trust, that affirms what they care about and that um, works with their values and then gives them those solutions, the more they hear about it, the more that breaks through those, those, mental, those mental shortcuts that people have that are kind of leading them down the road of making decisions or, or acting against their own best interests or misperceiving the risk. Um, I like to always put the picture of the kitty with this particular um, uh, suggestion, and that's including an emotional release valve. And I don't necessarily mean we should just give everybody a picture of a cute, cute animal every time the conversation is getting rough. But when we're talking about risks, it can be a really intensely emotional conversation and people can go down the road of feeling pretty hopeless about things or feeling very worried. Um, and they don't necessarily have that ability to process that emotion. And so just giving people that space to, to feel and, and acknowledge their feelings and acknowledge um, what they you know, may be going through or what their thoughts might be um, is really helpful. But at the same time, it's also really important that when you are talking about risks, that you're not necessarily going on negative emotion overload. Um, a good rule of thumb that we use is one third negative emotions and two thirds hope and action. And that for every third of um, the conversation that you're talking about as a negative emotion, um, 
include two thirds actions and, and hope and giving people a reason to say, okay, I can actually do something or I can make a difference. And that I can't just, don't have to just, sort of just sit here and wait for something bad to happen. So, <clears throat> and then following on with that, I always want to note that it's really important to be careful about using disaster imageries, um, disaster photos. There are a lot of folks out there where the disaster photo is something that resonates, um, but there are a lot of folks that find that disaster photo to be um, overwhelming or emotionally intense in a way that um, they don't necessarily want to incur in, in, tap into, if you will. Um, you know, maybe they've been through a disaster or a family member has been through a disaster. And so those negative feelings come up and people are going to want to avoid that negative feeling. And this picture is one of those that actually is very personal to me because I, you know, I, I live on the East Coast and I've never lived on the West Coast, but my family's from California. And this picture was um, in Time Magazine a week after the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa, California. And it was the centerfold of the magazine. And it's actually what, what's left of my aunt's house. Um, and so every time I see this picture, even though it's really beautiful, it brings me to a place where I'm like, I don't know that I necessarily want to be there. But I do include it because it's giving that example of that, you know, disaster photos can be very personal and maybe it's not necessarily something that you want to focus on a great deal. So um, just a quick plug for um, the Risk Communication Basics Guidebook. Um, it's on Digital Coast. It discusses some of the social science principles behind our risk perceptions, some of what I just discussed and a little bit more. And it also provides additional key tips rooted in that social science research for improving science uh, risk communication. And then more importantly, it also provides sample conversations to see how these tips work in action and maybe provide that example for something that you can use to um, um, practice for conversations in the future. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Cheryl, you're on mute. Yep, just getting off here. It, I do not have any questions in the, the Q&A at this time. So if anybody um, has a question or a thought that um, came to your mind as we were going through this, I did have um, a question in the chat while the presentation was going on about would this be um, recorded? And yes, it is being recorded. That recording will be available on the Eden website. And we'll be getting a notice out. I just finally figured out how we can get these recordings um, captioned and accessible. So be looking for when they are available. So we do have a question that has come in. And that is, how do you evaluate the success of these communication strategies? Um, that's a really great question. Um, I don't know necessarily how to evaluate it um, in terms of a research perspective, but I think um, you'll start seeing these tips as you're communicating more with people. It's not a one-shot deal. Um, it doesn't happen overnight, um, but it, you'll gradually start seeing perhaps, um, you know, some folks coming, you know, making small changes. It's moving folks along a spectrum, if you will. And, and people don't move along the spectrum very quickly. Um, but, you know, I think that's a really great question. I think that's a really great opportunity for some research to start looking up. Okay, the next question is, have you seen marked differences in the worldview based on age? Um, that's that's a really interesting question. Um, worldview is your worldview is really formed by about the time that you're 18 or 20, um, and it's based on you know your your environment of where you grew up and and the folks that you grew up around and their ideas and their worldviews. Um, and it's not something that necessarily shifts dramatically as you get older, unless you um, have a major change in your social network or um, you perhaps go through a traumatic event. Um, I don't know that I'm not really familiar with any research that has really had a chance to look at that and how that tracks. Um, if somebody wants to do a dissertation, that might be some really interesting research to look at. Um, but I don't know that there's necessarily a change in my age. You might see some generational um, similarities because that's 
you know, again, that social network and how, you know, the things that people grew up around and that, that you know, what they learned from a folks. Okay, so another question is, do you have any advice on communicating long-term risk by dealing with a recent disaster? The VI just went through Irma and Maria, but I'm still trying to continue my marine debris and other environmental education and people are losing interest. Um, you know, quite, I, I think that something that dramatic and that extreme, those storms, it may be that, you know, going to that finite pool of worry, that their, their emotional capacity at this time is so focused on the really big things um, that they may not necessarily be able to focus on something that other than protecting their immediate life and getting their immediate basic needs met. And so um, it, it, it's, you know, it's looking at, you know, timing and whether or not, you know, you're a professional on the ground and you're, you're able to read your folks a little bit better than somebody from, you know, not from your area. Um, but it may be worth just, you know, having some conversations with folks and, and sitting down, sitting them down and getting them to talk about, um, you know, their thoughts or their fears or their concerns. And then, you know, using that as that starting point, kind of meeting people where they're at and then moving the conversation forward. So we had a question of whether we can get the link to the risk communication guidebook in the chat. Um, so maybe why I get when I move on to evaluation, you may be able, Sarah, to quickly put that link in the chat. In the chat. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. And I'll. Okay. Another question that we have is communicating risk about climate change impacts, such as sea level rise, is a challenge for our Sea Grant program in Hawaii, since the impacts may not be seen for a long time or a while. Any advice or guidance on communicating risk for a natural hazard that may not happen in the short term, such as sea level rise? Um, that's, that's something that I think about daily, believe it or not, because that's a big part of my job as well. Um, the difference is that in Charleston, we are actually seeing those effects now, and so, um, people have something to connect that with, um, but I don't know. I don't know that I know enough about Hawaii to be able to give a really good sound advice. But you know, if you have some, you know, maybe for some folks, maybe looking at um, what has happened in the past and looking at, you know, whether or not there have been any changes, and focusing on, you know, what kind of data do you have that's going back in the past, and then connecting that to, to current events. You know, maybe you're getting a king tide every now and then that you didn't used to have impacts from. Um, and maybe that's something that you can illustrate that impact for. Um, you know, if you have data that's looking at within, you know, the lifespan of a mortgage, maybe connecting to, you know, how that might change. Um, just some ideas. Okay. So an, another question here. In disasters, there are people in a, in a range of emotions on a spectrum from very intense to... I don't care. So how do you judge the midpoint communications? Um, that's a really good question. I'm not really sure how, um, I'm, 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 I guess I'm a little confused about what you're trying to ask. Could you elaborate a little bit more? So why, why we look for some more on that one. I'll give them time to type. Um, so here's just a comment. Sea level discussions are also tough on the East Coast. Some communities don't want it discussed. They want development to continue. So just a comment. Um, I'm not seeing additional information on, on Gwendolyn's question. Um, let me move on. Um, it looks like. Well, let me go. I, I just pulled up Gwendolyn's question. Okay. Um, and I think I, I just needed to read it a little bit better. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, looking at, 
I think what you're trying to do is, um, you know, look at your audience and how big it is. Maybe your audience needs to be more, you know, more concise and smaller. Um, and that, you know, maybe uh, you, you don't necessarily have to judge a midpoint for the communication. Maybe you are able to customize that, edu that communication to folks on that range. Um, the folks who are I don't care are going to be very hard to talk with and they may not be, you're, you may not be able to reach them. And so you may have to let them come to you. Um, whereas the folks who are, are very intense and very, very upset, um, maybe it's, you know, giving them a space to, to talk about their feelings and start working through that. Um, but, you know, recognize that, you know, you're right that it is a very big spectrum. Um, and so, but maybe, you know, one of the things that um, you do is to change, kind of, you know, break up your audience or break up your communication to match the audience. Okay, um, and thanks, Gwendolyn, for adding more to that one. Oh, the next question is is a whole other topic, and and that is we start talking about what is your advice about using different social media versus traditional media and face to face communications for risk communications. Where should you put the most effort for the best effect? That's a really great question, and that's also one of those topics that I think about um, frequently, um, because I think that for some people, social media is where they see the most information, but it's not necessarily where um, that, that behavior change is going to come from. Um, honestly, the most bang for your buck is really that face-to-face -face communication, especially that one-on-one -on -one communication with folks that, you know, it, it's a conversation with people they know and trust already. Um, and that's hard because sometimes you, you need to get a larger message out. Maybe you're doing a larger outreach effort and you want to involve as many people as possible. So you want to use traditional media and just in social media. Um, but, you know, I think that my, my personal feeling and that, you know, knowing that uh, I have had a lot of time in social media and traditional media, I have found really and truly that face-to-face -face communication to be far more effective, and that's where you get more um, more ability to start changing rather than it's a flash you know, on a screen and you're scrolling past it and you're going, huh, interesting, and moving on. Um, I, I think that the social media that tends to drive that confirmation bias a little bit more. Okay. Um The next one is, ask, I'm going to, to switch to another question here. Are there any suggestions for communicating with the, the media? Since you were just talking about media, what about communicating to the media? Um, oh boy, that's, that's, that's basically a webinar in itself. Um, so I maybe think that's the biggest... Topic. Yeah, a future topic, but I think one of the most important things, and I'm saying this as a former reporter, build relationships with your with reporters that you work with. Um, if you build those relationships, you have better ability to um, incorporate them and be able to communicate with them a little bit more effectively, maybe have more of a conversation rather than blasting out press releases and having them publish the press release um, basically unedited. So. Um, you know, building that relationship with, with your media and also understanding what your, your reporters need, um, what kinds of information they're looking for, what kinds of, you know, just format they're looking it for, um, and, and how can you best meet their needs while they can also meet yours. Okay, great. So here's the question of what about talking to or training youth. Do you have any tips on working with our, our younger generation and, and getting some of this to our youth? I, I think I'm just going to give a very simple answer to that. And that is, um, I think we, a lot of youth tend to feel very disempowered and, and kind of like nothing they're doing is going to matter anyway and that they don't necessarily have a role in it. Um, and, and they have a very essential role. And especially because when we're talking about climate change and, and very few long-term future, long-term risks in the future, it's their future and it's their world that they're going to be inheriting. And so I think 
helping them feel like they have a space and that they have a, a, a position that their voice is important um, and then that that it's not you know they, they can actually affect change um, and doing that kind of I think helps them feel like they're part of the conversation and brings them to the conversation okay so here's another one is knowing your audience as simple as knowing where the community sits in general general relative to six Americas are there other frameworks to consider? Um, that's a really great question. Um, I, I think that knowing where folks are relative to Six Americas helps provide that piece of, you know, a good piece of information and that you can make some, some assumptions based on that. Um, but I think there's also more that you can learn about them. And I don't know that there's necessarily any specific framework for it. But it's, you know, how do they feel about local issues? If, you, if you're talking, and, and that's something that I should have highlighted in, in my talk, is that making this local, making this relevant, almost down to this is my backyard, this is what's going to affect me, this is how it matters to me. Um, if you can find that out, that, or, and if you can tailor communication to making it, you know, obvious for why somebody, why, why it affects somebody, that helps make it um, much more relevant. And so that make, gives people more of an idea of like, okay, that's something I should pay attention to. Um, for example, rather than, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of photos that we look at are, are more of that global problem, whereas it's also in your backyard. So um, I think you can learn more about folks. I don't, I think that's up to you to figure out, you know, where you are and where people are at. Um, maybe you, you need to talk to, you know, folks who work with your audience to see, okay, how are they perceiving this risk and how are they talking about this risk? Um, how are they talking about solutions? What are their thoughts by that? Um, and start, you know, doing a little bit more um, digging about who people are and, and why they are the way they are. And that might be a little bit more effective than just focusing where folks are on the spectrum. Great. Well, that took us through the Q and A's that, that we had, and I think I captured a couple of the questions um, that we ha also had in the chat. And just let me switch over here. Um, you will notice that a couple times within the chat, I have put a link to a Qualtrics survey, and we ask that you just take a couple minutes of your time to evaluate today's webinar um, in the chat box, and we appreciate this. We're also looking for some additional webinar topics, or if there's a topic that you um, feel would be appropriate, appropriate for this Eden Professional Development Series and would like to say, I would do this webinar, please feel free you know, to contact me and we'll get that into to the information. Sarah just provided in the chat box that link to the risk communication basics. So grab that while you're, you're wrapping things up too. We will also, when we, we put the recording on the Eden website, place that link to that for, for your future reference too. So please take a moment, complete that evaluation. And Cheryl, I wanna add something to sure. what's on that link to the risk communication basics. There's also uh, two other resources on there, and that is um, an example of a handout for stakeholder engagement. Maybe you're, um, you need to give a handout or a community, you know, a community that needs to have a handout for their CRS points. Um, we have an example of one that you can actually just use um, that, that has some lots of solutions and tips on folks that you know, we can also, it also illustrates kind of what risks actually are. Um, and then there's also a customizable PowerPoint template presentation that can be used as a, as a basic foundation for if you're doing a meeting um, or a community engagement meeting about um, uh, you know, flood risks. And you can use that to use the tips in that to make your meeting a little bit more effective and more engaging and interactive. Okay, great. I would just like to also announce the, the February webinar, which will be Valentine's, February 14th, same time frame um, as, as this webinar.
starting at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our topic is going to be community rating systems. So once again, back to the, the National Flood Insurance Program and looking at the community rating systems from a collaborative approach. Our presenter is going to be Madeline Russell. Uh, Madeline currently has been with the Georgia Sea Grant. She's having a change of, of positions here. Um, but just so know that Madeline is still going to be doing this webinar for us. Tying into some of the conversation today about social media at, for our April professional um, development webinar, we will have Trey Rice with us from Texas AgriLife Extension, and he will be talking about some of the lessons learned using social media um, through some of the Texas um, situations of, of this past year. So for those of you that do have that communication social interest, know that we will have upcoming um, webinars on those topics um, and to be watching for that information. So with that, I would like to thank Sarah Watson um, for her time and sharing her expertise with us today on this Eden Professional Development webinar. Um, we appreciate everyone's time and, and participation and also once again, um, please take time to grab that link to the Qualtrics series and or Qualtrics evaluation and help us um, evaluate and learn more about how we can better improve this webinar series for you. And Mark, thank you so much for handling our logistics today and helping with the webinar program. Ronnie, thank you so much, folks. We'll see you again next time.